my husband Dave. Um, uh, Dave, Dave and I actually have been married for a really long time. I'm not going to tell you how long because then you'll do the math and you'll figure out how young we were when we got married. Um, but uh, we, by the, by the way, we met at Michigan Tech. Uh, it's engineering college in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and we've been together ever since. So, um, uh, Dave, you probably do a lot. You kind of feather in a lot of information about how you got your drone and stuff like that. So I'll just yeah. let you take it unless, oh, I guess I should say that you're an engineer, consulting engineer, um, born and raised in Indiana. And I'll let you take it from there. Got here in Colorado as soon as I could. That's right. <laughs> okay. With a couple of stops in between, but anyway. All right. So um, let me share my screen. Yep, live demo. There we go. Get over to this, and here we go. All right, collapse the the just a second. No, well, that'll have to work. Okay. Anyway, uh, as you can see, title of my show is droning on. Um, and I hope I don't do that too much tonight. And you know, photography with an altitude, uh, really photography from a different perspective. And one of the things I always uh, say about drone photography is that, you know, I've got a very long tripod. And as I'll tell you a little later on, it can be as long as, as uh, uh, 400 feet. So it's very useful. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail of things, uh, but kind of gloss, you know, you know, touch on some of the rules and regs, which are really important when you when you start flying a drone. This is a highly regulated activity by the federal government and by the local and state governments. Um, so there are a lot of do's and don'ts. There are more don'ts than there are do's, but um, there's certainly enough out there to, to photograph and video and uh, uh, once you get comfortable with where you can and cannot and what you can and cannot do, uh, it, it's very rewarding. So with that, we're going to start with uh, kind of an opening uh, set of sequences of some videos and stills just to give you an idea of uh, just what it is you can do with a drone. So here we go. Hello. Shocking. By the way, Spoke Boy Productions is just my chop I put on things. It's not registered or anything.
Let's end this with a little bit of fun. Anyway, so welcome to drone photography. Um, I don't, it's also known in the FAA as uh, UAS or un, uh, Unmanned Aerial Systems. So uh, if you're cruising around the websites, things like that, and you see UAS, it means drone in our world. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the legalities up front because that's really important. And like I said earlier, you know, this, this activity, uh, unlike um, normal photography, <coughs> excuse me, and videography is, is nothing but regulations and do's and don'ts. So let's get this out of the way first. Um, there are basically two types of drone pilots. First is a recreational user, and that's me. Um, I just do it for the fun. And as I always say, it keeps me out of the bars. Um, as a recreational user, I cannot make any money or have the intent to make any money from flying a drone. And it's, it's kind of hard to understand, you know, well, GJ, why can't you just post something on YouTube and let everybody see it? Well, by posting on YouTube, the feds don't know whether or not you've got some agreement with Google to, you know, get some, you know, clickbait money or things like that, or people, you know, say, hey, can I buy that photo from you and whatnot? So it puts it out in the, in the, in the public realm that could be uh, a profit motive. And so um, people you see posting uh, drone videos on, um, on the websites are most likely commercial pilots. And if they're not, they're taking a big chance. Uh, there was a particular drone guy that I watched early on on YouTube when I was first learning about drone piloting. And he was a stand-up comic in Philadelphia. Um, really funny guy. And a pretty good pilot. I mean, he, he took some very amazing photos, but I've always said, geez, this guy is taking a lot of risks and I don't think he can do that. He's flying at night and he's, you know, he's getting really near buildings and, and just, you know, some things that I would have thought at that time in my, in my uh, investigation were off limits. Sure enough, the FAA came down on him and hit him with a $160,000 fine. Um, he was just using it as a, as a front end for his stand-up routine. So uh, he's gone. I have no idea what happened to him, but he's, uh, uh, he's off the air. Um, so I'm just not touching it. People can take a chance if you want, but I keep it to myself and family and friends. Um, so outside of recreational users, who can make money? Well, commercial pilots, and they do general photography and real estate, obviously. Um, a lot of technical side uh, inspections are drone driven, uh, not only uh, from a, a photographic standpoint, you know, checking movement of materials and stuff like that, but the big commercial drones can carry sensors, infrared, uh, uh, LIDAR uh, type, uh, type devices. Uh, you know, we fly, not we, but as an industry, uh, as Ellen said, I'm a consulting engineer in the oil and gas business. Um, we, had, by and large, have replaced many of the fixed wing and helicopter operations for in monitoring and things like that with drones. So it's a, you know, it's a fabulous, uh, fabulous way to do it. In fact, even some of the uh, uh, geophysical operations are now being undertaken by drones instead of, you know, 
$10,000 an hour or $50,000 an hour helicopters. So big deal. And of course, you know, if you're a commercial pilot, you can post videos and tutorials, et cetera, on social media. So while I'm not a commercial user, I am registered with the FAA. Uh, you have to have a, you have to register your drone if it's of a certain weight uh, with the FAA. It costs you five bucks and I think it lasts you know, three to five years, I'm not sure. Uh, and then recently they've also instituted the, the requirement of passing a knowledge test online. And, and if you pass that test, uh, they issue you a trust, what's called a trust certificate. And that's an acronym for something and I don't have that written down, but it, it essentially is a piece of paper you've got to keep with you when you're, when you're flying your drone. Uh, the knowledge test is very simple. It takes about 20 minutes. There are multiple providers out there. If you're interested in that, just Google trust, trust certificate and you'll find uh, multiple people that you, know, you can take the test from. It's free and everybody passes. It's just something the FAA wants you to do. Um, if you want to be a commercial pilot, you have to pass and hold what is known as a Part 107 certificate. And that is essentially, for all intents and purposes, without the flight training, um, uh, a pilot's license. You have to learn how to read navigation charts. You have to learn how to handle emergency situations. Uh, I'm in the, you know, probably a third of the way through a, an online course right now that's uh, 21 lessons uh, that, uh, to uh, you know, prep you to take this class. And you have to go to a testing center to take it uh, and pay a fee, I think it's $80. And if you don't pass, you gotta pay another $80 and go at it again. And so it's not an insignificant thing. And with everything else I've been doing, uh, work and family and whatnot, I just haven't gotten it completed yet, but I'm working on it because I would like to have that freedom to do more things with my, um, with my material. Okay, this is kind of funny, the 20,000 foot rules for drone operations. You know, we're gonna look down, but we're actually gonna talk very low to the ground, um, just the highlights. And we'll start about at the ground. Uh, one of the big limitations of a drone pilot, and this is whether you are a commercial pilot or a rec pilot like myself, is you have to fly below 400 feet above ground level as, as measured. If you see the, the uh, screenshot over to the right, uh, that's an actual screen from the control system on my phone. Uh, I'm not sure, yeah, I can't get my cursor over there. Um, you know, the height is uh, right dead center in the, in the screen it says zero feet. So I'm sitting on the deck, uh, the drone is powered up, ready to fly, and it's telling me that I'm, you know, at zero altitude, and I've drifted a little bit with GPS, so it says I've traveled eight feet. Well, obviously I haven't, but uh, that's just deep GPS drift. And so when I take off and then fly over the deck and out into the valley, I will, uh, within a few hundred yards, be over 400 feet above ground level. Because we, you know, we live above Evergreen, and you know, if I was to fly over to, you know, actually more than a couple hundred yards, but say a half mile or so into Evergreen, I would be way above 400 feet above that ground level. So it's a constantly moving target, and you have to be aware of that and plan your flights accordingly. Um, yeah, it's not really a problem, but it, but it is a limitation. And um, as an example, this is a, a panorama shot uh, last, uh, I think it was October 15th or so. Let's see, is there a date? October 21st um, of the Troublesome Fire, East Troublesome Fire up by Grand Lake. And uh, you can see the screenshot of the, the uh, metadata out of Lightroom. Uh, by the way, I process all videos, you know, or I hold them all in Lightroom and I process all photographs within Lightroom. And I do the videos you've seen and a few more you'll see here going through, we're done in Premiere Pro. Um, I've got a Creative, Lice, uh, Creative Cloud uh, uh, license because of, of my work I use. I'm a heavy user of Illustrator and Photoshop and things like that for you know, my, my uh, il you know, illustrations and drawings for my work. So I've got Premiere Pro, I'm gonna use it. Anyway, you can see from that, uh, that shot that I'm sitting at 270 feet above my deck above ground level. And that was definitely high enough to get a really good view of, of, the, uh, of the fire. Uh, I took another shot closer to 400 feet. I probably should have shown that too, but uh, actually this one was better. Uh, it showed a little more perspective. So 400 feet is about, you know, that's a good limit above, uh, above, you know, above ground. Um, also 400 feet is interesting because that's the, 
that's the level at which uh, most small aircraft, unless they're landing or doing operations, helicopters and crop dusters and things like that, they have to stay above 400 feet. So that 400 foot interval is kind of reserved for, for you know, unmanned aerial uh, you know, systems, drones. Um, that's going to change. Uh, there's going to be some, you know, there's going to be some movement in that with the with the FAA. But for right now, it's 400 feet. And this one's a little more pertinent to what what we do uh, around here. Um, what are some of the restrictions? Well, you cannot fly in what's known as restricted airspace. Uh, the map over to the uh, uh, to the right is uh, from an app that I use to to you know, locate restricted airspace and tell me about it. Um, the blobs that are different colors are either uh, airports, uh, cities, uh, and in this, you know, in this map, I also show Rocky Mountain National Park. So there are a multitude of, of areas that just by, by FAA rule, by their restriction on airspace, that you cannot fly over. So the airports, stadiums, police stations, hospitals, you know, I list them. Uh, very critical. In fact, today I, I, I was out shooting a, a, a quick screenshot and a quick video for this show. And I, for the first time, I got a, a notice on my controller that said, you know, warning, a restricted airspace will be in effect from one o'clock till five o'clock tonight or this evening for the ball game at Coors Field. I'd never seen that before. And so that's a new, you know, they're constantly throwing stuff out. And the drone that I have is new enough that it, and I've got all that turned on, I get those restrictions. I get those constantly. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, by the way, that app is, is uh, I wouldn't say it's sanctioned by the FAA, but there's a link on their site for it. So they kind of support it. Okay, you cannot fly in what I or what is called restricted areas. And that's kind of important for us right around here. So that means that I'll just list them off: state parks, open space, mountain parks, Evergreen Lake, rec, you know, rec center controlled areas like the ball fields. Uh, and you know, I like to go to Bear Creek Park as a place to to you know to cycle. You can't fly a drone there. Um, uh, it's it's pretty restrictive. But you think about it, and you're hiking in Elk Meadow. You don't want some guy buzzing you with a drone. I mean, you know, let's get real. Um, there are, you know, within some of the open space systems, uh, Lakewood Parks, but you know, for instance, does have a one of their parks down, uh, I forget, you know, off of Wadsworth, I believe, that has a drone flight field. You know, I've never been there. I don't need to go there to fly. I can fly right here on my property. Um, but there is, there are places to go. Thornton has one too. Good areas to practice, but not necessarily to photograph. All right. Let's go on with the 20,000 foot rules. Um, so, well, Dave, where can you fly your drone? Well, any unrestricted airspace or areas. And, you know, so you saw there was a lot of open area on that, on those maps, but with caveats and some common sense restrictions, and that's really important. Let's talk the obvious. In particular, you can fly your drone in, in national forests. Um, with you know some local restrictions, you know, including buildings and operation centers and trailheads and things like that, would probably be you know out of bounds. But you're out in the middle of nowhere, um, and it cuts through uh, you know Forest Service land. Yeah, you can fly, uh, and this includes Mount Evans for the most part, um, as you've heard from Ellen's talks in the past. Mount Evans is kind of divided up into you know some, you know some different areas. Most of it is controlled by the Forest Service. However, there are uh, you know, chunks of it controlled by Denver Mountain Parks, Echo Lake and Summit Lake, for instance, are off bounds. You can't fly around those. Uh, the, uh, I'm not sure about the wilderness areas or the, or I'm sorry, the uh, wildlife areas. Um, I didn't get a chance to look that up before tonight's talk, but I would assume that those are off limits and as they probably should be. Um, but you can still fly your drone in Mount in the, you know, the general Mount Evans area. I've not done so. One of the things you got a problem with when you get up that high is the operational saline for my particular drone and most prosumer drones that we you know, might be using. It's fairly low if you think about it, 16,400 feet. Um, and even at this altitude compared to sea level, you've seen I've been down to the ocean and I've flown my drone down there. Um, there's a vast performance difference between 8,000 feet where we are and and sea level. 
uh, battery life is, is much lower up here. Uh, the drone is more sluggish, though I never knew that because I flew, you know, a bunch of, you know, 25, 30 hours up here and never, you know, never knew. But if you go up to, you know, Mount Evans and you're, you're flying around 10, 12,000 feet, there's a possibility and you know, a high probability you'll see a performance difference in that this is not enough air for those props to, to, to uh, cut into. So um, be aware of that uh, if you do take your drone up there. Just like us, we have a hard time getting oxygen at that, uh, or harder time at that, uh, at that level. Drone works harder too, and those motors work a lot harder and the battery life plummets. So just be aware. And where are you, where can you fly? Yeah, over and around your property. Uh, we live on a little less than an acre here in Evergreen. And uh, we're blessed that we've got a great view and we've got a little mountain behind us, a little ridge line. And I've spent bulk of my time flying around our house. This was uh, a shot I took last fall, early winter, I believe, that, uh, you know, completely hand flown. This is not a program that, you know, flew the drone for me. I've, I've been practicing of doing these sweeping movements like this. And I was above our property at all times. And so, and pointing towards our house and our mountain. And so uh, completely, uh, you know, completely legal and, and, uh, uh, fun to do. If you live in a subdivision, you know, yeah, flying your drone around your house, probably not a great idea. And we'll talk about that. Um, so other quick rules of operations that are important. Um, you've got to keep your drone in visual sight at all times. Uh, if you got your face buried in your controller, watching you know, parameters or taking a picture, you really should have a, uh, you should have a spotter watching your drone. Um, I believe you can use you know, a spotter with uh, binoculars to follow the drone uh, while you're flying. I believe that is, um, uh, that is permissible. I've never been in that situation. I've always been able to keep the drone in, in my, my uh, line of sight. But uh, in any event, both recreational and commercial users um, have to follow that rule unless you get a waiver. If you're a commercial user, there are waivers that are now being uh, uh, put out there by the FAA that allows for non-visual flight rules. So uh, keep our eyes on, good joke there, keep our eyes on that situation. Um, you can't fly over crowds. Uh, part 107 pilots, the commercial pilots may fly over people with uh, certain restrictions and with permission. So you can, uh, you know, news organizations use, use drones extensively. If you watch, I believe it's Channel 9, uh, and if you probably know a lot of the, you know, there's only like one news helicopter in Denver now and they all share space on it. So Channel 9 has been a big user of drones. I see, I see their footage all the time. And uh, so they must have some, you know, broad waiver with the FAA to allow them to do that. Now, when I took a crowd picture last year, I didn't have that waiver. You might recognize this scene. Some of you, this is from the last year's calendar reveal party. I did have permission, I asked the uh, Mount Evans folks. Um, and I went off the edge of the parking lot. And you, you, if you guys are there, you probably saw me put the drone up and this is what I got. Just a nice perspective view of the, uh, of the reveal party uh, you know, for the calendar. Um, would I do this today with what I now know? Uh, probably not. I'm a little more circumspect about these things. So I would probably not uh, shoot this photo again. And then uh, a little joke here, as a rec pilot, uh, you cannot fly at night, uh, but that definition is a little murky at this time. Uh, commercial pilots have more rights to fly at night than we recreational pilots. And I tried to get that, tried to find clarification on that uh, before this meeting and uh, it, it remains murky. So um, you know, I'm looking outside right now, we're kind of in that civil twilight uh, period. Um, I might still fly now, uh, but with a, uh, an anti-collision beacon, which I have on top of the drone, a little flasher that you know, uh, lets you see where the drone is, but you know, complete darkness, no, I, I wouldn't fly. And uh, we'll see what the FAA comes out on that in the future. Almost done with the rules. Uh, common sense ones. You know, don't disturb or harass wildlife. And I've read tons of 
you know, comments and people, you know, saying, yeah, these drone pilots chasing herds of elk and stuff. Yeah, I've, I've, I, I can believe it. Uh, I was out flying, you know, early on since I had the drone. Uh, I got it last June. Ellen gave it to me for Father's Day, probably because I was cooped up for, you know, for COVID and very appreciated. Um, and I was about to take off and, and I did and headed up towards my favorite tree that, uh, you know, is at the top of our ridge to go take a look at Mount Evans. And there I saw a large raptor bird. Uh, somebody else more knowledgeable than me can tell me what that is, but it's, you know, I wasn't going to get anywhere near it. And it sat there, I don't even think it even looked at me, but I, it was far enough away when I took this photo. So, and further, um, some of you may know me, you know, I'm a member of what I call two unpopular groups. I'm a cyclist and I'm a drone pilot. I guess, you know, given my career, I'm also a member of three unpopular groups being in the energy business, but yeah, whatever. Um, but, in, but in all cases, one needs to observe some protocols. And I wrote the, ne you know, the next line, I wrote this, you know, back in the early 2000s, I was, I was president of a Team Evergreen at the time, a cycling club here in town. And I um, wrote a monthly article and I had a, a reason to talk one time about about uh, interaction with people, and I'll just read it. I mean, it's really important. Anyone you meet or interact with has the potential of taking away your privileges. So just you got to be aware. Uh, you pass somebody, or you, you know, on your bike, or you fly too close to some uh, state senator or or representative or county official, and they see you doing something they don't like, and they think you're basically an asshole. Well, you know, we might get more privileges. You know, the privilege of flying is a privilege. It's not a right. It's not, there's no constitutional right to fly a drone. Um, so please be considerate and polite and don't be an asshole. Um, and while we do have the right to fly over private property, um, it, it should be avoided at all. It, you know, it, it, it should be avoided if possible. And what I mean by um, we have the right that is, un, or that is uncontrolled airspace. So you're flying, you know, the, the airspace above your home, up to the uh, top of the trees uh, surround on your lot. That airspace above those trees or above your building um, belongs to the FAA and is controlled by the FAA. And so that's unrestricted airspace. And you, we as drone pilots could fly through it, but um, we're asked to, you know, observe privacy. Um, you know, think about would you like a drone flying over your house buzzing around, you know, who knows what they're doing. Um, you know, you don't want to read about it in next door, for God's sakes. Um, but if you do need to, you know, fly over somebody else's property, um, ask their permission, ask and inform. Uh, commercial pilots do this, you know, for real estate purposes, things of that nature. Yeah, you've got to be able to, you know, move around in that airspace, but ask permission. Here's a real life experience uh, on the restrictions. Um, last year at the start of the Elephant Butte fire, uh, we got the alerts from the various uh, uh, you know, pop-ups on our phones, actually smelled some smoke. And uh, I immediately went on the deck and, and, and put the drone up in the air you know, to go you know, take a quick look around. It's kind of like an up, per you know, up periscope operation. Have a look and see what I could see, and you know I came away with this picture of of the start of the Elephant Butte fire. Um, uh, there were no aircraft on the scene yet, and I did not receive a warning uh, on my controller that there were any aircraft in the area. So I knew that it was okay to you know to fly, um, and because if there are flight restrictions with an air, you know, with a drone like mine, and we'll talk about what that is. Uh, and future drones and uh, uh, you know, others are coming out all the time. My drone will not take off if I'm in restricted airspace. The, it, it, you know, the GPS reports back, it comes to the controller, it goes out and says, nope, sorry, you cannot fly and you just can't take off. Um, but even so, here's the common sense thing. I wouldn't have flown anywhere near that fire. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just bad business. And then the next morning, um, I went out you know, early. This was like six o'clock in the morning. Um, there it goes. Um, and I captured this photo. 
uh, at a low level, low altitude of about 20 feet, a panorama to the north so I could you know, document the, the smoke that we were getting from the elephant from the fire. Um, and just minutes after that, I tried to go up again and the airspace was locked down. Uh, my controller reported back that I could not uh, take off and the drone just, you know, just sat there. Um, but I, you know, in that situation, I could request electronic clearance through the, uh, uh, through DJI's uh, website. You know, it's a low level restriction. So I was able to get that unlocked and I was able to fly uh, for the next 30 days. Now, that was a 30 day restriction the FAA put on around the Elephant View fire. Okay, enough of the you know, we, if you have any questions about that, we can talk about it at the end, but that's kind of just what I call the 20,000 foot view. But what actually is a drone? Um, I'm sure everybody's seen the, you know, seen pictures and whatnot, but let's talk about what mine is. Um, by the way, my drone's name is Huey. Um, if you're a uh, fan of a uh, fairly bad 1970s sci-fi, you run across a movie called Silent Running. Um, there were three drones in that movie, little robots, one of them you know, named Huey, Dewey, and Louie. So my first drone is called Huey. The next one will be Louie and Dewey. Anyway, um, I've got a, a DJI Air 2 uh, circa 2020. Uh, it's got a one half inch sensor. You know, this, you know, this is important for the club, you know, important for you guys as photographers. Um, and it can shoot both 12 and 84 uh, megapixel uh, photos fixed aperture of 2.4, uh, effective focal length of 24 millimeters. Um, the 24 megapixel is kind of a tongue in cheek. It's really, they, you know, that's an interpolated uh, resolution. They take each pixel and divide it into four digitally and give you 48 megapixels. Um, I've, I've tried it. It's, I don't care for the, uh, for the resolution of it. I don't care for the sharpness and, and uh, quality of the photo, so I don't shoot in 48 megapixels. Um, this drone is comparable you know, to, a, to a prosumer camera, a DSLR, you know, I'm guessing here, you know, similar to the Nikon 7000 series or something like that. Uh, you put it all together with extra batteries and a carrying case and extra props and stuff, and it'll cost you just under you know, approximately a thousand bucks for this drone. Um, it has been superseded by another one. We'll look at that at the very end of the presentation. Um, and the drone is capable of shooting in uh, you know, high definition uh, and panoramas. Uh, the two photos to the right are HDR photos, um, uh, bracketed either with three or five images. Uh, that is my preferred um, uh, mode of uh, shooting uh, standard images is to use HDR. And I'll kind of show you why here in a minute. Um, and this drone and many of them in the same, the same class and above can save images both as JPEGs and RAWs, also very important, allows, allows you know, the image quality to come out like, like you see. But my favorite method of, uh, of drone photography is are by, you know, hands down panoramas. Um, I think that's what drones were made for. Um, in you know, my particular drone, I run it in a 180 degree mode mostly, um, and it shoots 21 individual frames uh, at 12 megapixels, non-HDR, so it's just you know, whatever I've got the exposure set at or automatic, it, uh, it uses that. And they're stitched together to show a, you know, to create a single JPEG image. The three on the, on the, on the right uh, are those standard JPEGs that come directly out of the, the camera on the drone. The uh, image to the bottom is also using uh, or is using raw images coming out of the drone, and I bring those into uh, in the Lightroom. Though you can use Photoshop and create the panorama. Um, that has become my preferred method of of uh, creation. I'll show you why. Okay, this is a a, a pano taken by the drone at an altitude of two feet. So it's actually below my eye level. So Dave, why don't you just use your camera, you know, and, and swipe your iPhone across? Well, they can't, you know, iPhone can't get this and camera on a tripod and you got to get that out and swing it around in an arc and figure out your angles. And yeah, that's, you know, if I was into that, I would do it, but no, hell, the drone can do it just fine. Um, and, you know, so I took this, this, uh, this photo one morning recently 
Um, but you'll notice if you follow along the railing and you look, you look at it, you see some disjunctures in the, you know, just where the image didn't come together right. And it kind of jumped around, particularly over on the right side. And you know the aspect ratio of the chairs doesn't look right. You know it's, you know this is a great photo, and I was happy with these until I figured out how to do you know the uh, the raw images. This is a great photo to you know toss off to your friends or you know send to your family. Say hey, great sunrise, you know. But then you take those those uh, raw images into Lightroom and create something like this, and you'll see that the uh, the railing line is perfectly, um, not straight obviously, but perfectly consistent. There's no jumps, there's no gaps. The aspect ratio with chairs look normal. The table looks normal. The tree is leaning exactly the way that tree, tree leans that way. It looks exactly you know, uh, the way it is. Um, and so it does a much better job in the, and it does, you know, as a raw image, you can do a much better job with the uh, color corrections. So at the top is the standard panel that comes out of my drone, you know, basically 8,000 by 3,000 pixels. Uh, what I call a Gen 2 is at the bottom. Uh, you can you know, see the re you know, remarkable difference between the two. And also you see then that Gen 2, there's a lot more to that image that the, you know, the in-camera processing just throws away. You've got the uh, umbrella on the left, you've got another you know, chair uh, and some rock and the full fireplace on the right. So, um, uh, this is now my preferred way to do it. I, if I had time, I would have you know, taken a couple of snaps of, uh, of the process that Lightroom goes through. Uh, it, it's pretty, you know, you know, it's pretty uh, you know, black boxy, but you can set it up and you can see where it actually makes the crops. And you can actually tell it if you want, you know, if you want it to, uh, and you can do this in Photoshop a lot better, I'm sure. Um, you can tell it, let it create some sky and stuff on the sides, and it'll replicate and do the, you know, the content aware, you know, creation of uh, of additional uh, material. That really hasn't worked out for me, so I just don't do it. I I, I like what Lightroom does. Um, and so, what do you use? Don't everybody hate me for this, but 90% of the time I'm shooting in auto mode. I know, gasp. But there's a really good reason. You're up there flying. You're you're getting you're getting yourself positioned for the shot. Uh, light conditions are changing constantly, faster than I can I can react by getting into my controller and changing the settings. And so you know, yeah, safety first when you're flying the drone. You've got to be aware of what's going on with that machine at all times. And I don't like being distracted. By going, hey, should I be at 125th, 125th of a second or 160th of a second? You know, what's the best way to do this? So, 90% of the time, I'm letting the thing fly. And that's why I use HDR because let the drone do the bracketing for me. I'll bring it in, fix it in post. You know, I'll get the exposures I need um, and uh, come out with some pretty good images. Um, but if you do shoot in manual or what you know, DJI in this situation calls pro mode, um, you see down on the lower right hand side of that uh, screenshot image I am now you can see all the various you know I put it in the you know pro mode and you can see the you know the various uh, parameters um, I'm shooting this at 1 1 60th of a second I you know, ISO 200 white balance is auto I'm not playing any with that and you can see the histogram looks good um, maybe you'll tell me it doesn't look good but it looks good to me yeah, I'm just a wreck user um, and the exposure meter there says zero zero. So yeah, I'm you know I'm happy with that. But I couldn't do this without the the picture up the top. I've got a uh, a variable neutral density filter attached to the camera uh, of the drone, and so um, I can you know play with that neutral density filter. I like the variable because I don't have to power the drone down and snap off the filter. And, you know, put a two on. No, that's not good enough. I better put a four. You know, I can just. I can just rotate the dial and come up with uh, come up with the uh, uh, the uh, stops that I need to create the image. Um, I actually do this more in video than uh, in stills. Stills and the you know the panos I hit you know just the, the the panorama mode just shoots in auto. You can't shoot in pro. Uh, and you can imagine that that drone is swinging around in a 180 degree arc up and down, up and down, up and down. Its exposure is changing constantly. 
And you know, there was no way that we as humans could you know, react fast enough to be able to change that exposure. So I just let the drone do it. But the, the, the other use of the HD, or the, I'm sorry, the um, uh, neutral density filters is in videography. Um, the standard um, for uh, frame rate and shutter speed in, in videography is shutter speed should be two times your frame rate. And if you're, you know, I like to keep a 30 frames per second for most, uh, most work like you've seen here. It's nice and smooth. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of called the cinematic frame rate and, you know, 24 or 30, I, you know, I keep it at 30. Um, uh, to be able to pull off the, the uh, you know, a shutter speed of 160 or 160th, um, you've got to sometimes play with, you know, the neutral density filter to allow you to run that shutter slow enough. Um, uh, under normal conditions, the shutter might want to run at one, you know, one five hundredth, one six hundredth, whatever. Um, but to get that that uh, um, silky look, if you will, cinematic look, you've got to get that two times uh, shutter speed. So that's a really good use of that neutral density filter. But I use it, you know, I use it frequently for for um, uh, stills. That opening sequence you saw of uh, that, by the way, was. Um, um, Noble Lighthouse up in Maine. We were there this summer, um, and I wasn't intending on the neutral density filter to be that that set high. It was probably I think it was set to five stops with this this particular filter. But I did want a little bit on there because I didn't want to blow out that that sun when I popped over the lighthouse. And I think it worked. It's, it lost some of the detail of the rocks and whatnot, but I'll give that up for the the effect of popping over the um, popping over the lighthouse. Okay, speaking of video specs, and I wasn't going to write this down, so I just did a screenshot. Um, you know, the video resolution, uh, if you do shoot, you know some of these parameters. I tend to shoot at that top line, the 4K HD, uh, and I shoot at a 30, um, uh, 30 frames per second uh, on, you know, for most of the work I do, work, most of the fun I do, excuse me. Um, let's get a few more things up. The, uh, yeah, as I said, the 30 frames per second is considered a cinematic standard and it works. Um, uh, longer videos, you know, the stuff you saw was all shot at 30, 30 frames a second. Uh, 60 frames a second and above is needed for slow motion and for stop action. Uh, I, use, I use higher frame rates with my, I also do GoPro video. You've, you've seen some of my work on that. That's pretty much what I've got. I've got an iPhone, a GoPro and a drone, that's it. Um, that I will run at 60 or higher because I want, I want to be able to slow the action down. Um, the trouble with the GoPro, at least the one I have, you get above 60 frames a second uh, at 4K video and you don't have any image stabilization anymore. I and mean, that's a problem when you're hurtling down a mountainside on your bike at 30 miles an hour and yeah, you want image stabilization. So you got to make some, you know, some uh, either buy a new GoPro or uh, make some adjustments. Um, and the thing with the drone, you got to be careful on, and this may have changed with some of the other models, but my model is that you get at 60 frames a second and uh, some of the, you know, the uh, artificial intelligence modes, which I don't, I'm not going to go into a lot, but the drone can do a lot of things on its own. I like to do it myself, but there are cases where I just want to, you know, you know, circle me and take a, take, take a photo you know, move away from me and, you know, or, you know, take a video. It's, you know, standard drone stuff. I try to do that myself, but every once in a while, I, you know, I do use the, the, uh, the auto features. Um, the pin will work at 60 frames a second because the optical, you know, the obstacle avoidance shuts off at 60 frames a second. So you got to be careful with that. And if you're flying around trees and buildings and things like that, and you're shooting at 60 frames per second, and you're not in, in uh, one of the auto modes, uh, yeah, your optical avoidance cameras are off. And so uh, you got to be aware. One of the other uh, features of the drone that uh, is kind of, you know, it's not in the specs here, is uh, my drone now has digital zoom at, at 1080p or that uh, what they call the FHD on the line, third line down over to the left, um, it'll do a four times uh, optical zoom. Uh, I'm sorry, digital zoom. And 
wonder if I can get this to play. Yeah, let me get this to play again. And now watch it if you weren't. Watch the parallax. This is called a dolly zoom. I am moving, I am moving the drone backwards and zooming in at the same time. And that creates that parallax. Look at Elephant Butte there, how it comes up in the, the tree, my favorite little dead tree. You know, just looks like you're zooming away from it, but the Elephant Butte is coming in. That's a cool effect, particularly in architecture and, and some of the uh, real estate stuff I've seen. Um, and you also notice if you look at the look at the quality of the color as a day, that's an awful color. So, yeah, because I shoot in what's called deep cine light in uh, in, uh, in in DJI land. Basically, it's a, fat, a flat color profile because I can take that into the same shot, take that into Premiere Pro or Final Cut, or I think even uh, iMovie can do this. Um, I can apply uh, uh, lookup table uh, values, do color correction. I can fix the color. And so if I let the drone take the color and do its little HD magic, I generally don't like it. So um, I you know, prefer to do the uh, D-Cine like the flat color. And, you know, as, as I often hear you know, people say, fix it in post. All right, almost done here. Yeah, I'm sure you've got lots of questions. What's out there? Um, this is just a screenshot from the uh, DJI website. Uh, they're the biggest seller of drones. Uh, there are some better ones. I'm going to show you one here after this um, that I would like to have at some point. But you know, I've got the center one, the Mavic Air 2. It's been superseded by the one to the right, the uh, Air 2S. I guess they're kind of like iPhones now. You know, the next version is an S. Um, but it's got, you know, where mine has a half-inch sensor, the, uh, um, the 2S has a one-inch sensor. And they've, you know, they call their AI master shots and they've kind of doubled the amount of things you can do, uh, added, added new features. Uh, the video instead of 4K video is 5.4K video, okay. Um, and you can go further away, uh, you can go 12 kilometers away and still have uh, transmission. Uh, but remember my point about vis visual flight rules, you gotta be able to see the drone and so the only way you're going to see the drone at 12 kilometers is to have some binoculars on or some sort of spotting scope. So, you know, there are, there are limitations here. Um, the drone to the left, called the Mini 2, um, that's a really good entry-level drone. Uh, it, it didn't look up the sensor uh, settings, but it's probably a half inch or, or a micro four thirds or something like that. It's not a big sensor at all. Um, it doesn't have any... Um, uh, it has very little in the way of obstacle avoidance. Some, the, the original Air or the original Mini had no optical uh, or obstacle avoidance. Uh, it's got some obstacle avoidance now, and it's it's easy to operate, very simple. But you notice that top line there is 249 grams. I don't know if I can get my cursor over there. That's really you know a lot. A lot of people think that's really important because the the limit for registering your drone is 250 grams. So you buy a, a, a Mini 2, you don't have to tell the FAA about it. You know, it doesn't cost you five bucks. It's no big deal. It's not like they're, they're, uh, you know, they're going to come knock on your door. Um, you go up the line a little bit in the DJI series, you come up with the Mavic 2 Pro and the Mavic 2 Zoom. Um, a lot of people like the Pro because it's got a Hasselblad camera, a 20 megapixel one inch sensor. Cool. Um, but did you know Hasselblad is now owned by DJI? Has been since 2017. So it's a bit of a marketing thing, but that's okay. Uh, it takes great photos. Um, the zoom, uh, notice it doesn't have a buy now on it. I think they're, they, they are discontinuing these drones. These things are three, four years old. They're at the end of their product cycle. So if you wanna go out tomorrow and say, damn, I gotta get a drone. Um, don't get a two pro or a two zoom because they're about to be replaced you know, any, any, any day now. I thought they were gonna be replaced today actually, but they, you know, their big announcement was a handheld gimbal, not a drone. Um, but any of, these, any of these drones are great. Um, the, price, you know, the price level goes up, you know, when you get to the pro series, you know, that, you know, that's the basic drone at 1600 bucks. You add the extra batteries and the props in the case and you, you know, get up to, uh, to 1800. Um, it's just the way DJI sets their things up. And okay, if I had a lot of money, 
and I just go out and buy another drone, have it in my stadium or uh, back pocket, I buy one of these, it's called the Skydio. And the, the only reason I really like these drones and their cameras are great, they're, they got great specs, but these things will follow you through trees. It's got 12 obstacle avoidance cameras all the way around them. Now, these are various models of you know, you know, accessories of the exact same drone. Um, but instead of working on line of sight, you know, my drone, you draw a box around the, you know, the person. Um, you remember that beach scene where, where our, you know, our friend Ray was, was uh, you, know, you know, playing Obi-Wan Kenobi with the drone. Uh, well, I had started that sequence by drawing a box around him on, on the controller and telling the drone to follow him. These guys, these Skydios, do it by a, a, a beacon sensor you put in your pocket. And so if you're out riding your bike, you drop one of those beacons. And again, I'm sorry, I can't get my cursor over there, but it's, you know, you know, look at the left-hand picture. It's the one, you know, it's the one, you know, below the, you know, the drone to its, you know, to its left to our right. That beacon sends out a, essentially like a, a Wi-Fi signal. And that drone will follow you through thick brush. It'll go around trees, it'll fly over, it'll fly under. Uh, they are really cool. And these, you know, these drones are now being, uh, you know, the professional levels of these exact, this exact same technology can be programmed to fly uh, industrial sites over and over and over again. You could take one of these out and plug in a pattern, you know, upload a nav file, if you will, to the controller, and it'll fly the exact same pattern every time. My drone doesn't do that. I've got a, you know, I've got little points. I know I'm, you know, I'm going to be, you know, over that tree next to the rock at 20 feet, shoot my pan out. Um, these puppies can, you know, can fly, you know, based on a nav file. So really cool. Um, there's a lot of drones out there. DJI is the biggest one. They seem now with the Biden administration not to be in trouble with, uh, with the U.S. government. We'll, we'll see, but you can still, you can buy them. Um, there was a lot of lobbying against uh, import bans uh, against DJI. They make, you know, they make good stuff. Um, kind of a paraphrase, you know, you're going to use another uh, you know, sci-fi reference here. You know, all the best stuff is made in China, Don, you know, instead of Japan. Um, anyway, that's about it. Another sci-fi reference. So long. It's been, been good. Thanks for your time. And uh, we'll say goodbye.